Okay, so hopefully you got an outline as you came in. Uh, you'll want to make sure you have that. And I think the, the most important thing that we do this morning is actually read the prayer <laughs> together. And um, so the, the prayer is on the first page here. And again, this is the entire chapter of John 17. Um, before we read that, I just want to point out, if you turn to the very back page, page 8, um, I've put some recommended resources here. If you want to go a little bit deeper into uh, this prayer in particular. And so some books that were helpful to me um, are there. Uh, J uh, James Montgomery Boyce's commentary actually has about 15 sermons on just this, on uh, just uh, John 17. <laughs> so I, I couldn't even get through them all. I, I tried, but it was just, it, you know, it would have taken a lot more time than I had this week. Um, but anyway, I love James Montgomery Boyce. He's probably, arguably my favorite commentator, um, probably the guy that I, that I look at more than anyone else. Um, and then F.F. F. Bruce is a, a tremendous New Testament scholar. His, his commentary on John, I would say if you only had one commentary on John, that would be the one to get. And, um, and then D.A. Carson would come a close second to Bruce. Um, he has a, a, a little book that's about 200 pages on the farewell discourses and final prayer of Jesus. Um, so uh, an evangelical exposition of John 14 to 17. And then a huge volume in the Pillar New Testament commentary series, The Gospel According. If you want a scholarly commentary on John and you want to know what the Greek says and theologians say and stuff like that, then that, that would be the go-to commentary. And then some just lay-oriented lay, uh, commentaries by pastors. Matt Carter, Exalting Jesus and John. Uh, John Phillips, Exploring the Gospel of John. Chuck Swindoll, Insights on John. And Warren Wearsby, uh, Be Transformed, which is from, uh, covers John 13 to 21. So just, again, you know, for those of you who want to go deeper into this and want to uh, spend more time, those would be some references to look at. All right, let's go back to the prayer. So John 17, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it, and if you could follow along. So, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, and again, he had just talked about, remember John 16, what's John 16 all about? Those of you who are in BSF, <laughs> you should be quick to respond. You just, had, you just went through John last year. Uh, what was John 16 about? How about the teaching leader of... BSF, right here, Jody, put you on the spot. But John 16, what's, what stands out about John 16? Who's the, who's the star in John 16? Close. <laughs> you, got to, you got the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, John 16 is pretty much all about that Jesus is going to leave, but he's going to send him another of the same kind. Uh, meaning that he's going to send another person of the Trinity. And the reason that that's going to be greater than Jesus being here is Jesus, because he has a body, is localized. But because the Holy Spirit is spirit, like he's in all of us. So when Dan and I were on vacation the last few weeks, he was with us in Newport. Wherever you guys were, he was with you there. Well, if Jesus is here and the Holy Spirit isn't sent, um, you're basically got to wait for Jesus to show up. And so, uh, and, and again, that, there's all kinds of issues related to that, the, you know, the omnipresence of God and so forth. But, but the reality is he says, I must go in order that I can send the Spirit. And that you're going to do even greater things than I did. Because now all of you have access to the same power and person that I've been relying on in my humanity. You have the same resource. Okay, so... After he talks about that, this is where he goes. I mean, I'm going to send you this, the Holy Spirit. You're going to do even greater things than me. And then, he's, and then he starts to pray. And so he says, Father. So who does he pray to? He prays to the Father. And that's what he tells us to do in what, in what we call the Lord's Prayer in, in Matthew 6 and in Luke. Um, but to address the Father when we pray. And he says, the hour has come. And again, what, what hour is he talking about? 
Christ. Yeah, yeah, that he's he's come to uh, his mission has arrived. The whole reason he came uh, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, and he's going to do that by becoming a ransom for us. So glorify your Son. So the first thing he prays is glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now. About 65% or more of the time that we're going to spend is just going to be specifically on that aspect, on what it means for, for Jesus to be glorified, what does it mean for us to glorify God, what does glory mean. We're going to spend the bulk of our time on that because I think that's incredibly important and it tends to be an abstract concept for most of us. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time on that. But he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I, again, here's that term, glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now... Uh, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So that whole first section, the first five verses, the key phrase there is glorify. Glory, glorify, the glory that I had with you, that I'll be glorified again. So this is a very important, this is the, f the foremost important thing for Jesus, is that he would return to the state in which he was in before he took on human flesh and came here to serve, that he would have glory again. So we're going to talk, again, the mo most of our time is going to be about that and what that means for us today. Okay, then he continues, and now the subject changes a little bit. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So again, there's a special relationship that Jesus has with those that follow him, his disciples. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified. There it is again, glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So he's, he's praying now for unity, uh, unity among his disciples. And again, that unity should reflect the unity that exists among the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So the basis for the glorification, the basis, the basis for the unity, actually all the things he prays are to be found in the community of intimacy that is shared among the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. So uh, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction. And who is he talking about there? Judas. Judas. Um, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I'm so glad he's praying for our joy. <laughs> God wants us to, to have joy, and Jesus even said in John 10, 10 earlier, uh, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest or abundantly. Okay, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And this is something he speaks about a lot in, in John and the other Gospels, is don't be surprised that you're hated by people in the world. 
Okay. Don't be surprised that you're persecuted. Don't be dis despised that you're talked down about, that you're uh, slandered and so forth. And as Christians today in America, we, especially if you've been here a while, you've seen the decline of how people view God, Christi Christianity, Christ, anything to do with Jesus. It's, it's been on the decline for years now. And, and it's going to get worse. Okay, so uh, get used to it. But again, this was this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You either follow the authority of God and the truth of God, or your own uh, internal system of feeling and thought. And most people go with that because it's easier. It's and honestly, it's the lazy way. <laughs> It's the easy way, it's the idolatrous way, and that's our default mode. So he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world. Again, again he doesn't save us and then immediately take us out. He leaves us here. Why? Um, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And I'm grateful that he prayed that. <laughs> they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And I can't even tell you how important that phrase is, that reality is. Uh, one of the things we're going to do when we, when we continue in the series on world religions, we're going to finish Roman Catholicism. And then I'm going to go probably into a pretty extensive time talking about worldview and worldviews. And it really, if you, if you want to nail it down, and I'll spend quite a bit of time on it, there's really two views. There, it, you can really boil all worldviews down to two, and that is oneism and twoism. And I'm going to spend a whole, probably two, three sessions just on that reality. But uh, if you take new, the New Age movement, for instance, the New Age movement, which has been incredibly influential all over the world, um, <coughs> is that everything needs to be one. Now, this is a parody or a takeoff on what Jesus' prayer is. But that oneness for Christians has to start with what's true. Okay? You don't compromise truth in order to be at peace with people. That's what the world does. So the emphasis of the world and every government that has ever existed is they're not concerned about truth. They're concerned about power and control. But here's what I want to say. Jesus knows this, and I hope you know this. Truth is more powerful than power. See, because nobody t can take the truth that's inside you, the truth that you believe, even if you're tortured and even if you're killed, they can't take away what's inside you that you believe. So that's why when we die as Christians, if we're martyred as Christians, and maybe some of us will be, I don't know. Um, ho I hope you don't compromise the truth. I hope that you're so convinced that what you believe is true that you're willing to die for it. And nobody, even if they kill you, you, you go from being in your body to, to right, right after they kill you, right after you start, stop breathing and your heart stops beating, you're immediately in the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And they haven't killed the truth that's inside you. They've utilized power, but truth is more powerful than truth. I mean, I mean, uh, tr yeah, truth is more powerful than power. Okay? So I hope you see that. But that's one of the reasons why, as a pastor, I think that my biggest role, the thing that I take most seriously, is teaching you truth. I want you to be men and women that, have, that don't only believe things, but you believe them with conviction, and you can defend those truths with evidence. That we don't have a faith in, 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 in a leap in the dark, of faith. We have faith that's based on facts and evidences and good reasons. And so uh, everything I do pretty much is geared around this idea of what Jesus prays here, that if you're going to be sanctified, if you, in other words, if you're going to be like me, you have to be in the truth. You have to believe the truth. You have to be in the truth. You have to have reasons to believe why you believe what you believe. On the basis of what I've taught you and live for you, that's the most important thing. Don't worry about the power structures out there. It's very intimidating, but I just want you to know that truth is greater than power. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. I think that it's interesting that it says that sanctify them in the truth and your word is truth. It defines what truth is. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important for us to be in the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so... 
Yeah, Charlie. So, David, when, when we have, uh, you know, feelings and, yes. uh, and thoughts about yeah. something, <coughs> um, those are the results of our contemplation and analysis of, of something. Should we, do we ignore those? Do we put those aside? Um, or do, uh, how, uh, that's, that's looking within and focusing on your feelings. Yeah, yeah, quality. exactly, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it represents right. the result of our, you know, cognition about yeah. Yeah. trying to figure out the world. So how, how, how to navigate that? Uh, great question. And again, I think the answer is right here. Your word is truth. So we have to compare whatever we feel, whatever we think, whatever is going on around us and say, how does this compare with what the word says? And sometimes that means going against your feelings, mm -hmm. against your heart. <laughs> Yeah. And that's why Jeremiah says the heart is, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? I mean, I wish that was a, I wish that was a, uh, like a warning at the beginning of Hallmark movies. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't that be great, you know? It's like, uh, yeah, warning, Surgeon General says. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to add to that too, Romans 12 too. Yeah. You cannot be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, yeah. his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to use that very verse in our sermon today. Uh, and talk about it again. So, yeah, but great question. But again, I just think, Charlie, that the reality for all of us is a lot of our motives are impure. Yeah. A lot of what we do isn't for the glory of God. And we might even have good intentions. Um, but again, that's why it's important to look at the word. And I, I'm going to talk about this in the sermon, I, I, I'm actually going to pray for Steve Lawson. I don't know how many of you follow Steve Lawson, but um, I'm actually going to bring it up in the sermon. So I don't want to talk too much about this. But, you know, the, the issue comes up all the time. You know, here's a guy who's 73 years old. He's written over 30 books uh, that and I've read almost all of them. Um, uh, Jody's been listening. You know, she was walking, listening to him this week, you know. And, uh, and again, great Bible teacher, his theology is good, but here's a guy who's 73, he's a pastor, he committed adultery this, you know, he admitted to adultery this past week. So everything he's done, he's, he's a part of Ligonier Ministries, he's a part of the Master's Seminary, he's on the board of Master's Seminary with John MacArthur. Uh, he's got a church in Texas, he's got a ministry called One Truth Ministry, he's got all this stuff, and boom, I mean, and, and here's the amazing thing. Uh, Probably the best book I've read for men is called The Legacy. It's out of print, but it was the first book he wrote. And it's called The Legacy, and it's what kind of a legacy are you leaving behind after you die? He wrote that way too early in his life. <laughs> because the reality is here at 73, he did not finish well. Now, he still can finish well, and that's what my prayer is going to be for him. I, I pray that he repents. And, and, but I'm going to bring it up at church today because the reality is, Here's a guy who knows the truth intellectually, and we do too, for the most part, <laughs> but we still sin. Yep. We all do. And any of us, that could be us, but for the grace of God. Yeah. And it's just so important that we not only know the truth, but what he's saying is sanctify them in the truth. In other words, let that truth actually transform, not just that they're a bunch of eggheads, you know, with these big heads that have all this knowledge, but how does that penetrate the heart and how does that influence our walk because people are watching us. And, and so we need to speak the truth, but how do we need to do that in love? And Street Smarts, I see you have Street Smarts there. I'm glad you're reading that. I hope you all read that, but incredible book. I mean, we're covering that next week. Um, just a wonderful book. It's, it's one I'm going to go to again and again and again. So much good stuff in there. But again, what, one of the things Greg Kokel often talks about, who wrote Street Smarts and Tactics, is, you know, it, it's so important that you treat people with dignity and respect and gentleness. And that's what, it, that's what Paul says when he talks about witnessing. Um, but again, there, there's Christians left and right that I see falling, uh, and it seems like it's happening more than ever. Um, and so we really have to go, okay, God, man, if there's any blind spots in me, would you reveal that before I ruin your name in the midst of my family and those who are, I've been witnessing to and ruin that credibility that, that you have because of my sin? Um, 
You know, it's just, it, it's incredibly grievous to me because um, I, I know that if he's genuinely a Christian, and I think he is, and he's genuinely repentant, I, I just can't imagine the grief he's experiencing right now. Uh, and I hope that he, he presses into that and gets godly counsel and godly wisdom and that he follows that and that, and that he could be that example instead of so many that have done the same thing and they've just walked away and the name of the Lord is driven into the mud. Is, yeah. he, is he single? No, he's married. Yeah, I think he has five children and pretty sure he has a bunch of grandchildren. Yeah, he's 73 years old. So anyway, so um, it yeah. It doesn't matter how old you are. Yeah, right yeah. It's difficult. Right. But it pushed me when, when I heard about this to pray for you guys especially mm -hmm. because the lay yeah. people need to pray for the same. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it also proves the feelings. Feelings can't drive the train. Feelings are yeah. deceitful. Yeah. yeah. And again, I don't know what his circumstances are. I don't know the details. But again, for a guy that's 73 who's been preaching the word, you know, basically his whole adult life and written helpful books and he's helped a lot of people. Now, it doesn't, what happens a lot of times is people will look at that and they'll throw away all his books and say everything the guy did. No, I mean, again, what he wrote was true. But uh, again, it sort of takes like Ravi Zacharias. It's hard for me to read a Ravi Zacharias book now just because his lifestyle really didn't back up what he said. And so it really does ruin the credibility of someone. But, um, but again, the point is, and, and what you said, what you said, Jody, uh, is and the age factor. It doesn't matter. As long as we're breathing and living, we, there go us but for the grace of God. And we need to be really vigilant about it. So anyway, uh, I love this, this fact that, that Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. And your word is truth. And so as you sent me into the world, so have I sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. And then the last section, I do not ask for these only. So those were his current disciples that he is praying for. Now he prays for us. He prays for the future disciples. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they, they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory, and again, it gets back to glory. You see all these things weave together. Glory, the relationship that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have, the unity that's in that that's based on truth and not feelings but facts, and then that glory will result uh, for you, Father, from their lives. Uh, just like I've done, I want them to do the same. And then he says, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them, which that's an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. That they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory and that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, so let's go ahead and dive into some of the most important salient factors that he prays for. Uh, so there's three sections. There's a progression that takes place. So the first progression in the prayer that we see is in verses 1 to 5. And that's Jesus first prayed for himself and told the Father that his work on earth had been finished. And again, specifically, he's praying that he would receive the glory that he had with the Father in the beginning. Secondly, the second section is verses 6 to 19. He prays for his disciples, for the disciples at that time that were with him then, that the Father would keep them and sanctify them. 
And then third, he closed his prayer by praying for us, for you and me, and the whole church for all time, that we might be unified in him and that we would one day share in his glory. So that's verses 20 to 26. So as we review this prayer, we're going to focus on four priorities that we see. And what's important about this is if these were Jesus's priorities, probably not a bad idea that they would be ours. <laughs> okay. So again, to think that he's doing this in prayer, uh, incredibly important because this is the last prayer we hear him praying before he goes to the cross. So this is sort of until I return again, this is what I'm about and this is what my, I want my disciples to be about. So if we're not praying these things, we're not praying the same priorities that Jesus had. So I think it's important that we integrate these things into our prayer lives. Not that we don't pray about other things, but, but again, if this was Jesus' priority, it's important that we make it a priority as well. So first, the glory of God. Secondly, the sanctity of God's people. Third, the unity of the church. Fourth, the ministry of sharing the gospel with a lost world. And we today would be wise to focus on these same priorities. So I'm going to spend the bulk of our time on the glory, okay? So just sort of follow along. Again, there's a lot to be said here, but I want to hit sort of some of the key points here. So first of all, what, is, uh, what does Jesus mean by glory? Okay, to glorify literally means to reveal hidden riches. So there are riches in God that are hidden to most people. As a matter of fact, most people that are walking on planet Earth today, even a lot of Christians, don't recognize what a treasure God is and how glorious God is. Um, and so when the sun appears from behind the clouds, the gloom lifts from the entire landscape and a dazzling radiance illuminates everything in sight. This is the effect that is suggested by the word glorify. So again, God is glorious, but there are a lot of things that hide that glory. And many of those things that hide that glory are our own idolatries. And in some cases, just ignorance or you know, busyness, what, all kinds of things that hide the glory of God. But the glory of God exists whether we believe in it or not. Okay, there are two primary aspects to the glory of God. Now, this is something you're probably not going to remember all of this, but again, you have this, this stuff in your notes. But if there's anything I want you to remember, it's these two things, that, that there are two aspects. When you think of the glory of God or, or glorifying God, you need to remember that there's two primary aspects to the glory. There's an internal glory that is intrinsic to God's nature and character. And then there's an external glory, which is the outward manifestation or presence of God's intrinsic glory. So in other words, God is a spirit, but any time you see God manifest himself, especially in the Old Testament and then in the transfiguration in the New Testament, there's an external manifestation of his glory. And God can't appear without his glory coming with him. Because like the sun, the sun, you can't do anything about the hotness and the brightness of the sun. That is part of what the sun is, S-O-N. Part of what God is, is glorious and magnificent. And that's why I think that when you look at Revelation, those of you who are in BSF and you're studying Revelation this year, it'll be a while before you get to uh, the description of the glory of God in, in, in chapters 20 and 21. But there's glimpses of his glory throughout the book as well. But one of the things that you see about glory is heaven is full of jewels. And one of the reasons it's full of jewels is because those jewels uh, through those jewels, like a diamond, a diamond, if, if there's a diamond in this room and the sun's coming in, the diamond will reflect that glory into, diff into all the different parts of the, of, of the room. In heaven, the, I think the gems are there to actually magnify the glory that already exists with God. And that the glory will be manifested in every nook and cranny in all of heaven and earth. That's why it won't need sun and moon. Yeah. Yeah, again, but, but it, what those jewels, those gems do is they enhance the, the glory of God. And we'll be able to see that because we'll have glorified bodies. And sin won't be there. The devil won't be there. Pagans won't be there. 
It's going to be all believers who love Jesus and treasure Jesus and treasure his glory. And now we'll get to actually experience that external manifestation of glory. We don't get to see that now. But we do get to see the internal glory of God. And we get to partake in that because we, because we have the Holy Spirit, can manifest the same fruit that Jesus manifest: love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, and so forth. And so as you grow in sanctification in the Word and apply it, you become more like Jesus. In other words, what's happening is you're becoming more glorious. Yeah. Not externally, although that's possible. I've noticed that there's a certain political party where the, where the people are a lot more beautiful <laughs> and <laughs> handsome than the other party. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. But, um, but again, I, you know, there's a lot of Christians that just, beca just because they're in Christ, there's something beautiful about that. There, you've seen people before where you just look at them and go, that person must be a Christian. They exude joy. They exude glory. And, and that's the internal reality of a changed heart by a glorious God. Okay? So, so get that, that when you think of glory, some of you are caught up in the, the light, the brightness, the holiness, all that. And that's true. That's all true. That's all God. However, there's also this internal aspect and so well, when we're to glorify God, what that means primarily is be like me in the way you think, in the way you treat people, in the way you love people, in how you witness, in how you serve, in how um, that's glorious. And when God sees that, we bring glory to God because what, what is he seeing? He's seeing himself in us. Okay. So there's nothing glorious in and of ourselves. But if we're like Christ, he sees himself in us. It's the same thing as parents. Usually with parents, it's in the negative way. With parents, you'll see a kid doing stuff and, and you think, I used to do that. Or they'll say something. Where did he get that? From you. <laughs> okay. And, off, and, and it could be positive too. But oftentimes what stands out is it's something bad. And it's like, oh man, I used to do that. You know. And... And, but what's, what is that? Well, it's an inglorious aspect that has been passed on. And so what we want to do is we want to eliminate the ingloriousness of our sin nature and put on the new nature in Christ that is glorious. And that's the way we want to live in this world. Okay, so an example of internal glory, that next uh, paragraph there. Uh, Ray Stedman writes, when Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, the hidden riches and radiance of God's love and truth became visible to the world. John began his gospel by saying, the word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory. What was his glory like? Well, it was full of grace and truth. Though once they were hidden, all of God's inner qualities of grace and truth became visible when Jesus came. So in John 17, Jesus prays that through the cross, something that has been hidden from the world will now be manifested. Okay, an example of the external glory, Christ and, cre and the creation of Christ is the light. Because the Bible begins and ends by describing an untainted world that is filled with light, but no sun, and shows God as a source of light, it was fitting that Jesus called himself the light, saying, I am the light of the world. And he would continue by saying, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life in John 8, 12. It was an audacious claim because as Jesus spoke these words, he was standing in the temple treasury by the massive extinguished torches that had burned that very night in the ceremony of the illumination of the temple, which celebrated the Shekinah glory that led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness. It was a solemn declaration of his divinity as the light of the world. This divine light declaration ultimately identified him with the giver of light in Genesis 1. Indeed, Revelation says of Jesus, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So Revelation 21, 23. 
It was also an unfailing promise because Jesus needs merely to speak and men and women receive his light. Jesus the light was present with when creation was spoken into existence. The scriptures are explicit. John's gospel begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was what? The light of men. John 1, 1 through 4. Nothing, <coughs> nothing was made without Christ. Paul likewise affirms, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. All things came at once from God the Father and God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Paul says of Jesus, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or all authorities. All things were created through him and for him. Colossians 1.16 And then in the book of Revelation, again, we hear the 24 elders as they cast their crowns before him. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created, Revelation 4.11. So Christ brings order. The grand point is that it is Christ the light, Christ the creator, who brings order out of dark chaos of our lives, who brings form to the chaos uh, of our lives. If your life is dark and desolate, if your life is out of control, if there's no light in your life but only darkness and there seems to be no hope, there is. <laughs> the very same power that flung the stars out into the unfathomable, expanding universe while orchestrating life in the irreducible complexity of the cells of your body will act on your behalf if you come to Him. He will turn your night into day with a word. He will reorder your broken life with a word. He will bring them, uh, bring form out of chaos with a word. It is His specialty. He is not only the light, the Creator, the Son of God, He is the Savior of the world. This very one who created the fleeing constellations, who orders the cell, who sustains every atom, came and died on the cross for your sins. The one, this one will save you. He can bring a genesis, a beginning, to your life. That is what he came to do. If you have never understood this before, realize that there is hope for you. There is creation power that can recreate your life. There is eternal life that will turn the midnight of your life into dawn and daylight and life and spring. This is our God. He gives form, He reorders life, and He will do it for you. That's from R. Kent Hughes's commentary, Genesis. Yeah, really good. So that's, that's why I just wrote the whole thing in there, because I really liked everything he had to say. And again, it, 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 it's a key theme in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, that we don't think about a lot. That God is light. And just that, that metaphor, what is our culture right now? It's incredibly dark and chaotic. And the opposite of that is light and peace or order. And that's why you can have order and peace in your life in Christ in the midst of the chaos of this world. But again, the only hope for the people outside of us that are living in chaos is what he describes there. You, you have to come to the light. You have to come to Christ. And I think of, you know, if you're in a really dark room and you can't even see your hand and you light a match, mm -hmm. how bright is that mm -hmm. light? So that little tiny match. So in us, when we yeah. share the truth, we're sharing the light. You know, it's just, it, it just penetrates. I yeah. think of that and think of how powerful, yeah. even a little bit, I know how powerful right. that is yeah. in the dark. And again, what I would say about this, too, is to think that that external, that we participate in the, also the external glory to the extent that we're pointing people to the transcendent glory of Christ when we evangelize, when we serve people, when we're merciful to people. Um, 
again this week somebody shared with me that's new to our church how, how going through cancer for them has they don't know if they could have done it without the mercy that they've experienced from people in our church the love the kindness uh the d different ways that they have been ministered to and they were so grateful for marin bible church well that's that's manifesting the glory of god and she's declaring the glory of god through his people because again we would have no reason to do that in and of ourselves but if it's done for the glory of God, God's extrinsic glory shines the light on that, from that intrinsic glory that where we're being obedient to Him. Okay, so go to page four. So how does the finished work of Christ redound to God's glory? This is from James Montgomery uh, Boyce. He says, it does so because it reveals God's great attributes clearly. To glorify God means to acknowledge His attributes or make them known. It means proclaiming His sovereignty, justice, righteousness, wisdom, love, and everything else that may rightly be said about Him. But where are these attributes best known? The answer is at the cross. For only here is the perfection of God's sovereignty, justice, righteousness, wisdom, and love abundantly and unmistakably displayed. We see God's sovereignty in the way in which the death of Christ was planned, promised, and then executed without the slightest deviation from the prophecies of the Old Testament. We see God's justice in sin actually being punished. Without the cross, God could have forgiven our sin gratuitously to speak from a human perspective, but it would not have been just. Only in Christ is that justice satisfied. We see God's righteousness in recognition of the fact that only Jesus, the righteous one, could pay sin's penalty. We see God's wisdom in the planning and ordering of such a great salvation. We see His love, for it is only at the cross that we know beyond doubt that God loves us even as He loves Jesus. Jesus revealed these attributes of the Father fully by His death, hence, his obedience to the Father's will in dying fully glorified him. No wonder we sang, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. And then, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, this is God's glory and Christ's glory and our glory too, for we glory in Christ's death rather than any works or plans of our own devising. Okay, that's just a, that paragraph is just, is so good. Because again, it, um, you know, when we talk about Jesus being the only way and people get offended at that today, um, this really shows you that there is no other way. They're just, there can't be that takes our sin seriously and the holiness of God seriously. Um, and so we see a beautiful intertwining of the holiness and the justice of God, but also his grace and mercy at the cross, like we see nowhere else. Okay, how will Christ's uh, prayer be glorified with the Father again be answered? The answer is found in verse 5. And this, is, this comes from uh, Chuck Swindoll. Um, the Father will glorify the Son by restoring Him to the position He had with the Father before the foundation of the world. Jesus' divine goodness will be vindicated through the resurrection, displayed through His exaltation, and one day will be celebrated at the consummation. Remember, He's coming as King. When we talk about the glory of God and glorifying God, we need to remember that we're referring to a noun and a verb. The glory of God is a noun and means His majesty or His splendor, His display of divine goodness. This is from D.A. Carson's uh, commentary on John. When we talk about God's being glorified, the verb, we mean the appropriate response to His goodness displayed. So the glory of God, the noun, is His goodness displayed, and glorifying God, the verb, is His goodness celebrated. God is glorious regardless of whether anyone understands who He is, but we glorify God by seeing His goodness and worshiping Him for it. So we get to do that in the next hour together. We get to spend time 
worshiping him for his glory and praising him. And God delights in that when we do that. And we need that. And then Swindoll uh, gives this application on praying for God to get glory. When asking for ministry to expand, and I hope you all do that. I hope you all pray that your ministry would grow. Lead off your prayer by submitting all things to the glory of God. I would even go so far as to include the following. And Lord, if this does not bring glory to you, please deny our request and then guide us to accomplish your will and your way. That's great. That is a great thing to pray for. Okay, page five. The big idea, there, these are just some more quotes on just the glory of God and being able to comprehend this. The big idea of the Christian life is Coram Deo. Coram Deo captures the essence of the Christian life. This phrase literally refers to something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. To live Coram Deo is to live one's entire life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. Um, that would be, wouldn't that be great if that was on our gravestone? Yes. You know, uh, you know, Cindy Kirk lived in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the glory of God. I don't know that anything better could be said about any of us. Uh, but Jesus, definitely, that's the case for him. Uh, but that should be our goal. Um, John Calvin said this, he said, God cannot bear with seeing his glory appropriated by the creature in even the smallest degree. So intolerable to him is the sacrilegious arrogance of those who by praising themselves obscure his glory as far as they can. By the way, John Calvin had a huge following by the time he died and he asked Theodore Beza, who sort of was his uh, mentoree, and, and sort of took over a lot of the things that Calvin started in Geneva, said, please don't let anybody know where you bury me. Um, I, I don't want people to make a shrine to me. And so we, to this day, we have no idea where Calvin's buried. Um, but, but Calvin really did, you know, as I've been spending this whole year in Calvin, uh, it st what stands out to me is his humility. And the reason he was so humble is because he was so focused on God and God's glory. And that's what kept him humble. <laughs> Um, John, John Calvin again said, we never truly glory in Christ unless we have utterly put off our own glory. Jonathan Edwards, in you'll have to read this a few times to get the fullness of this, but Jonathan Edwards spent more time thinking about and writing about the glory of God than anyone I know. And in his, the end for which God created the world, he writes this. He said, the emanation or communication of the divine fullness, consisting in the knowledge of God, love to him and joy in him, has relation indeed both to God and the creature. But it has relation to God as its fountain, as the thing communicated is something of its internal fullness. The water in the stream is something of the fountain. And the beams of the sun are something of the sun. And again, they have relation to God as their object. For the knowledge communicated is the knowledge of God. And the love communicated is the love of God. And the happiness communicated is joy in God. In the creatures knowing, esteeming, loving, rejoicing in, and praising God, the glory of God is both exhibited and acknowledged. His fullness is received and returned. Here is both an emanation and rumination. The refulgent shines upon and into the creature and is reflected back to the luminary. The beams of glory come from God, are something of God, and are refunded back again to their original. So that the whole is of God and in God and to God, and he is the beginning and the middle and the end. Um, again, you have to read that a few times to get that, but, but what, what he's saying is that God created everything to go back to him, it, it, to point to him. See, New Agers get half of it right when they worship creation rather than the creator. The, it, the creation was designed to point them to the creator, not the creation itself. You and I are to live such lives not to draw attention to us, but to draw attention to the one that is glorious. It's the same thing. A rock is going to praise God. The mountains are going to praise God. A sunset is going to praise God. But a lot of people miss 
what those things are pointing to, mm -hmm. the glory of God. If you're drawing attention to yourself, you're doing no different than a New Ager does. Uh, everything is to go back to the source, the fountain from which the water comes, the light that, that is reflected from the source of the light. That's what Edwards is saying. And Edwards really took this seriously, like, like few people I know. Calvin, again, did the same. Tim Keller says, if there really is an, an infinitely glorious God, does it really make sense for the universe to revolve around us <laughs> rather than around him? <laughs> William Law, if you don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because you have drunk deeply and are satisfied. It is because you have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Your soul is stuffed with small things, and there is no room for the great. Uh, you hear Lewis reflect on that uh, quite a bit in his writing. John Owen, uh, great Scottish the uh, uh, English theologian said, to fear the Lord and his goodness and to fear him for his goodness, to trust in his power and faithfulness, to obey his authority, to delight in his will and grace, to love him above all because of his excellencies and beauty, this is to glorify him. And John Piper, the reason the universe is vastly disproportionate to man's size is that it is telling the glory of God, not the glory of man. <laughs> Okay, and then the next three points are, will be pretty quick here. Okay, so I'll try and finish in the next five minutes. Um, John Walvoord said, all the events of the created world are designed to manifest the glory of God. He was a president for many years at Dallas Seminary. Okay, so the second thing Jesus prays for, and again, we took most of the time to talk about glory because you could see why, okay? Um, but secondly, here's just a few quotes on, on sanctity from Francis Schaeffer. And Francis Schaeffer, in my opinion, he's one of the most important people you can read outside of your Bible. Uh, Francis Schaeffer was a, in my opinion, what was he? Well, he was an evangelist primarily, but I think he was also a prophet. Uh, he wrote about things that are even more relevant today than when he lived. And really, when you read him, you're just going, man alive, this is, sounds exactly what, like what's going on now. Uh, so I think he had a prophetic gift in that sense. Um, but here's what he writes in his book, True Spirituality. And I think these things are, are, are what Jesus is getting at when he prays for our sanctification. Uh, again, Francis Schaeffer from True Spirituality, which is a tremendous book on sanctification. Uh, we must remember throughout our lives that in God's sight, there are no little people and no little places. Only one thing is important. To be consecrated person in God's place for us at each moment. When a man comes under the blood of Christ, his whole capacity as a man is refashioned. His soul is saved, yes, but so are his mind and his body. True spirituality means the lordship of Christ over the total man. When my conscience under the Holy Spirit makes me aware of a specific sin, I should at once call that sin, sin, and bring it consciously under the blood of Christ. Now it is covered, and it is not honoring to the finished work of Jesus Christ to worry about it as far as my relationship to God is concerned. Indeed, to worry about it is to do, so, is to do spite to the infinite value of the death of the Son of God. My fellowship with God is restored. The Christian dead are already with Christ now. And Christ really lives in the Christian. Christ lives in me. The Christ who was crucified, the Christ whose work is finished, the Christ who is glorified now has promised in John 15 to bring forth fruit in the Christian, just as the sap of the vine brings forth the fruit in the branch. And then increasingly, I believe that after we are saved, we have only one calling, and that is to show forth the existence and the character of God. Since God is love and God is holy, it is our calling to act in such a way as to demonstrate the existence of God. In other words, to be and act in such a way as to show forth His love and His holiness simultaneously. Further, I believe that the failure to show forth either of these is equally a perversion. Of course, in one's own strength, it is only possible to show forth either love or holiness. But to show forth the holiness and love of God simultaneously requires much more. 
It requires a moment by moment work of the Holy Spirit in a very practical way. And I think there's a lot of wisdom here. And again, when you see, when you study the life of Francis Schaeffer and his wife and read their writings, there was almost this, it wasn't perfect, of course, but it was, it's as good as anything I've seen in the lives of somebody living out holiness and love. And God really used them to impact a lot of people and still is. Um, so, so he's somebody that <coughs> is worthy of emulating. Okay, then the unity of the church. And again, the last two are, are pretty short here. But in the unity of the church, let me just say this. Um, Jesus prays that believers will be united in him. But unity is not compromising the truth. Unity is not outlying any diversity. Unity is participation in a shared relationship with Jesus. D.A. Carson wrote, Unity is not achieved by hunting enthusiastically for the lowest common theological denominator, but by common adherence to the apostolic gospel. The beauty of diversity is summed up well in the classic quotation, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. In the sport of rowing, unity is key. Each oar must enter and exit the water at precisely the same time if the boat wants to maintain speed. The way the rowers stay in sync is by listening to the coxswain. The coxswain doesn't row. He sits in the back of the boat and calls out the strokes. The coxswain is the only one who faces forward. So the entire crew must listen to the coxswain's commands and respond. When that happens, the boat flies over the water. Unity doesn't come from everyone rowing their hardest, but from everyone submitting to a single voice. As the disciples submit to the voice of God, they grow more and more of the same mind. Their thoughts, desires, and intentions begin to mirror God's, and they experience a unity unfamiliar to them. And that's the basis for our unity as a church. Is Jesus is the head, let's listen to him. Let's follow him. And when we have disagreements, right, like, again, let's go back to the Bible to see what the Bible says. And let's try to humbly submit to that. And then lastly, number four, the ministry of sharing the gospel with a lost world. Um, great quotes here that I've put for you. Kevin DeYoung, since hell is real, we must help each other die well, even more than we strive to help our neighbors live comfortably. Since hell is real, we must never think alleviating earthly suffering is the most loving thing we can do. Since hell is real, evangelism and discipleship are not simply good options or commendable ministries, but are literally a matter of life and death. John Stott, the call of God is to share in his own mission in the world. First he sent his son, then he sent his spirit. Now he sends his church, that is us. He sends us by his spirit to announce his son's salvation. He worked through his son to achieve it. He works through us to make it known. Francis Schaeffer and the God who is there, when we have the opportunity to talk to the non-Christian, what if not the formula mentality should be the dominant consideration? I think it should be love. I think these things turn on love and compassion to people not as objects to evangelize, but as people who deserve all the love and consideration we can give them, because they are our kind and made in the image of God. They are valuable. So we should meet them in love and compassion. Thus, we meet the person where he or she is. John Piper, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and goal of missions because in missions we simply aim to bring the nations into the white-hot enjoyment of God's glory. Mm -hmm. The goal of missions is the gladness of the peoples in the greatness of God. John Stott, we need to look beyond the salvation of the nations to its ultimate purpose, which is that they too should come to worship and praise God. We should desire their salvation, not just that they shall know him for themselves, but that they shall praise him for himself. The greatest incentive in all evangelism is not the need of human beings, but the glory of God. Not that they shall receive salvation, but that they shall give to God the honor that is due his name, acknowledging and adoring him forever. We cannot be content until every convert 
has become a worshiper. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness, the nourishment of mind with His truth, the purifying of imagination by His beauty, the opening of the heart to His love, the surrender of will to His purpose, and all this gathered up in adoration the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of actual sin. And then A.W. Tozer, we're here to be worshipers first and workers only second. We take a convert and immediately make a worker out of him. God never meant it to be so. God meant that a convert should learn to be a worshiper and after that he can learn to be a worker. The work done by a worshiper will have eternity in it. Oh, yes. And then three summarizing points we learn about Jesus about prayer. Number one, prayer helps us keep God's glory as the first priority of every endeavor. Okay, super important. Secondly, prayer helps us remember that any God-honoring endeavor will succeed because of His power, not ours. And third, Prayer causes us to look to God for success rather than to the world. If Jesus' number one priority is to bring glory to the Father, what does that mean for his followers? It can mean nothing less than that the glory of God must be the top priority in your life. Everything you do should have as its purpose the worship of God. Every single detail of your life is intended to reveal and celebrate the goodness of God. The reason we live on mission and share the gospel is so those blinded to God's goodness may see it and worship Him. Our goal in sharing the gospel is not to enlist converts, but to make worshipers. All right, so uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, again, you know, you, if you want to learn from, if you want to learn something, learn from the best. <laughs> and so we've learned from Jesus. Uh, what made him tick and what was the center of his heart. And so we would be wise to do the same. So.